Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Oh, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> are you feeling any better? Um, you're going to feel my voice. I've been sounding like Minnie Mouse. Oh, no. And it's better. This has been going on for a month. Really? They've got me on an inhaler and all sorts of horrible things. Oh, well, I hope it gets better for you soon. I can't imagine going through something like that for a month. So I, I lost all my energy, which is, and it happened the week before Christmas, before my daughters were coming home. Oh. And it was bad. Did they test you for COVID and everything? No, I've had COVID. I'm boosted. Oh. And I'm COVID out. <laughs> <laughs> no, the minute before um, the um, um, at 11 o'clock, I was transferring the PowerPoint to this. Mm -hmm. For some reason, it saved an old version and not the version that I wanted. So I have had 30 minutes to do stuff. Make your revisions, yeah. Which one? Um, you should be able to share your screen. I think I said it. Now, so. There we go. Okay. It works. Okay. So you saw the blank conclusion. I had written it and didn't have time to redo it. All is very strange. Yeah. I don't know. You know what? Computers are so weird anymore. <laughs> Who knows? So I'm just hoping my voice doesn't go and that I don't, you know, start coughing. Yeah. But it's the best I've been. <laughs> and I knew I couldn't let you down because I couldn't get a hold of you because you were on vacation. Yeah. I, for and some reason, I can't do away messages. I wish I could. So I knew I had to do this. But I, it's fun. It lets me bring together a lot of things I've been thinking about. Yeah. I'm honestly really excited for this one. I think it's going to be really interesting. I'm back. All right. I don't know if you want to get out of the sharing for the moment and then when I introduce or if you have a screen you'd like to show as like a first screen. That is so not everybody's staring at your icons if you don't want them to. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> um usually it fills up. Um let me see what I can do. I can do it like that. I think it's, is it the yellow or the green? I haven't used a Mac in a while. Hmm? Doesn't like yellow or the green up in the top left so, expand? Um, what, what, you, you want to get rid of that? No, so you can expand your screen. So everybody's- so well, No, I did it. It's okay. Kind of, you shouldn't be able to see my background. I can see all your icons. How did that happen? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. We had 19 people show up. There you go. I had to redo the share. <laughs> um, we had 19 people sign up. Okay. So we made about $300. Hopefully they all remember. I think I sent about three emails. You said a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
I didn't think there'd be a big crowd because of vacation. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that many, honestly, but I was hoping. Maybe next year I won't do January and December. I think I'll well, off. You do it the first Monday, you want to. Yeah, especially like for January. That. Maybe you want to change that for January. Yeah. We've got some people coming in. I'm going to give them a minute before I let them in. I don't even know what time it is. Hi there, everyone. We're going to get started here in a little bit. Um, please make sure you're on mute and your video is off if it's not already. Um, and we'll get started here probably about five after to give some people some time to sign in. Thank you.
right, guys, we're going to get started here in about two minutes. Um, pretty much everyone who signed up has joined. Um, and I will introduce Dr. Stevenson, and then she will take it away. Um, we'll start here, like I said, in about a minute or two. Give some people some time to uh, join in. All right, thank you. Oh, please make sure you're uh, muted and that your video is off. Um, it'll make it uh, easier. Um, thank you. Can you all <clears throat> see the screen, my whole screen? Um, you should be seeing yes, yes, pictures of yourself or their names, and what else? The chat, right? And if you have questions during the talk, if you put them in the talk, and then maybe if I have great concentration, I can respond to them during the talk, but probably I'll do it right after. So yes. when you want me to go, Kim, just say go. Well, you actually took away some of my housekeeping stuff, so. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, like I said, or like Dr. Stevenson said, if you have any questions, uh, please put them at the chat and in the chat box, and we will try and answer some at the end. Uh, we'll get started here. So first, I want to welcome everyone um, to 2022, New Year, and everything. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Kim Giovanelli. I'm the executive director here at the Lancaster Medical Heritage Museum. Uh, as I've mentioned previously, if you could just please make sure you're muted and that your video is off, um, that would be great. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Stevenson here. Dr. Louise Stevenson is a history and American studies professor at Franklin and Marshall College, where she has taught since 1982. She has previously chaired the history department and the women's studies program and currently serves as campus representative for the James Madison Fellowship Scholarship Competition. In 1993, she was appointed board of trustees by Bill Clinton, where she served for eight years. We here at the Lancaster Medical Heritage sincerely thank you, Dr. Stevenson. And without further ado, I pass it over to you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see you all here, some very familiar names. And whether you know it or not, there are two people in your audience whom I've taught. Diana, is that you who sat in on my Lincoln seminar? She probably got her mic off. It is Louise, hi. Hi, it's great to see you. Oh, wonderful to see you. And so um, my, she uh, sat in on one of my first Lincoln seminars and as you know, I do write, happen to write books about him. So the other person here is the person who did the work that lies behind much of this presentation and my interest, because we discovered in the FDM archives that there were uh, diaries from men who served in the 111th Ambulance Corps and Emily Hawk, who is here and now a, finishing her PhD at Columbia University, transcribed them and they're available online. Um, and if you email me, I will send you the uh, links. Emily, hi, thanks for tuning in. So I started with the song over there because many of us when we think about warfare, think that it only happens over there. But my uh, talk today is going to use one of the medical society's former members and a former director of Lancaster General Hospital, Charles P. Stair, Star, to talk about how the linkage between here and there. So that was why I started with that song. Besides, I thought it would put us in a good mood. So let me see if my slide works. So here's uh, Colonel Charles Patterson Starr, 
And the kernel wasn't acquired till after uh, World War I. Uh, you have a brief biography of him in one of the books that the society published in 1994. I don't know who wrote this brief biography. It's quite complete. And it tells about his, uh, the facts of his life, but not all of them. And it doesn't link public versus private. And that's what I'm up to, to today. Uh, so, from I wanted to show you what I'm really talking about to there is public health. And he becomes an advocate and a practitioner of public health here in Lancaster. And then he takes that same con uh, concern to war fronts, both in France and earlier in, at the border of Mexico. And so we'll learn more about that. So here are the uh, talks, uh, the topics of my talk. I apologize for being a little disjointed and for so sounding a bit like Minnie Mouse. I have been suffering from bronchitis and this is the first time I've talked at length. So if I cough, you'll just, prove it otherwise. What? So this is what I'm doing. First, we're going to do F and M, then the him as a public health official in Lancaster, then his Mexican campaign against Pancho Villa, and then as the organizer and captain of the ambulance corps. So if we look here at the picture of him in the front, he's the tall guy, head and shoulders above everybody else. He belongs to the FNM military department. And I didn't know that this existed at FNM, but it did. It came into existence in the mid 1890s. And he was a member. He started off at low levels. And by the end, he's the unit's captain. And that's his brother up here, another star. This then is his senior picture over here on the left in the back row. So while at f &M, he was a left guard on the football team, not the first string. And But what's more interesting to me is he became involved in the YMCA. Uh, the YMCA was one of the most popular and widespread uh, campus organizations among students in the late 19th and early 20th century. And it was involved, it involves students in what we would today think of as social outreach and social work. So he's got both of those things going for him, both the military and his involvement with the community. Upon graduation, Upon graduation, he be, uh, becomes a doctor. Uh, University of Pennsylvania, class of about 1900. And then he has his internship at the Methodist Hospital there. I haven't gone into their records. I don't know what he specialized in. But he comes back to Lancaster and works for LGH. He's on its staff. And I suppose to supplement his income, and to act on his interest in public health, he becomes the school inspector. Now, I've only got a picture of a school that was built during this period, uh, but a modern school with indoor plumbing. And one of his initiatives as school inspector was to get rid of outhouses that were attached to schools. And you can just imagine the germs. What he does as school inspector is he visits each, uh, different schools and checks on the health and the sanitary conditions of both the school and the students. <coughs> the state had just passed a law saying that students had to be vaccinated against smallpox. And one of the concerns of Dr. Starr 
is to make sure that all students receive those shots. So he starts a free public vaccination program. And you can see his intent on public health and his belief in the efficacy of vaccination, which of course interested me because we live in the era of COVID and COVID vaccinations. Becomes even more interesting when you think about what the school inspector did. He closed schools when there was an epidemic and there were a polio, diphtheria, typhoid, chicken pox, and measles. Sometimes he only closed the school room of one teacher. Sometimes he closed the whole school. Uh, the biggest outbreak I found was of diphtheria between 1911 and 1913. And he closed eight schools, not for those that whole year, uh, but for a considerable period of time. Now, smallpox vaccinations are interesting because some children couldn't afford it. So what a star does is make sure that there are free vaccinations available. Therefore, children could come to school where they had to show a certificate that they had been vaccinated, much like our COVID cards. And that if they couldn't show a certificate, that they wouldn't be allowed to come to school. Therefore, they would be in violation of the truancy laws, which had just been passed in the late 19th century in Pennsylvania. So the free vaccinations allowed parents to have their children vaccinated and to avoid prosecution because of violation of the truancy laws. He also took public health um, to mean not just vaccination, but education. And he initiated a series of talks to principals um, in the schools on how to maintain public health. So he becomes school inspector. He initiates those reforms, which takes the advances of modern medicine into the community. And then he also joins the Board of Health. Now, Lancaster had had a Board of Health since uh, about the third or fourth decade of the 19th century. Uh, there were businessmen on it, there were doctors on it, and there were public officials on it. So he joins the Board of Health. Uh, he has become sufficiently important in Lancaster by 1910 that he gives a speech to dedicate the women's edition to LGH in 1910. In that speech, he emphasizes that his doctors are so delighted that people are realizing that diseases are best treated in hospitals uh, rather than at home by the attendance of a doctor. Second, he wants to make sure that the hospital care is available to all income levels of the community. So you can see his public concern in that speech. Now, between 1910 and 1914, the outbreak of World War I, a major event occurs. And we're going to get to that in a minute because I forgot I had to do milk. Milk. <laughs> we're living in an era of food inspection. You'll all remember, possibly, reading um, about uh, Theodore Roosevelt and the passage of the law, which establishes the National Food and Drug Administration. Well, that concern also occurs at the local level in terms of meat and especially in terms of milk. So I have on the left a milk can. What Dr. Starr didn't want, and he publicized and wrote about it, is for milk to be delivered in these cans and then for people to dip out with a ladle, which often became unsanitary, into their home con containers. I have down here a milk truck, of course, in downtown Lancaster. I have over here a company in Lancaster, in the middle here, if you can lean into your computers and read that, 
uh, a company capitalizing on the new concern with clean milk. And its milk bottle is over here, the sanitary milk company. Milk was sanitary because you're going to read here that it's pasteurized and sterilized and it's sold in glass bottles, which is how Dr. Starr recommended that people buy their milk. So why? Well, what farmers were doing is they weren't having their cows tested for tuberculin disease. Second, they were selling the milk and the uh, distributors were often unethical. They didn't keep the milk chilled. And furthermore, they adulterated it. So all of those things were leading to unsanitary milk and disease, especially among infants. We have to remember that mothers were being encouraged to use milk and not breast milk at this moment in history. So there is a rise of disease among infants be because of that. So I, the newspapers say, but I haven't found more evidence, that Dr. Starr wrote the municipal ordinance setting up uh, rules for milk distribution. And it required that each farmer had to have his dairy herd inspected for tuberculin disease, and he could only sell milk from non-diseased cows, certified non-diseased cows. So this was a big change in Lancaster in 1912. And I wanted to show you how this reform impulse of the 1890s in public health that we can apply our knowledge to the communities and especially our knowledge of food, pure food and pure drugs and improve public health with the aid of government regulation. So here you see that in Lancaster in 1912. Now, the other thing that happens in the fall of 1912 is a huge change election. On the left here is William Howard Taft. In the middle, you recognize Theodore Roosevelt. And on the right, you recognize Woodrow Wilson. These two fellows came from the Republican Party. He stayed in it, he left. So the results are shown on this map. And you will see what's happened is that the Republican vote split therefore allowing the red areas to win. So Woodrow Wilson becomes president. If you look right here, you have to look really tiny and you'll see Lancaster didn't go for what, yes it did, there it is, it's blue. I hadn't looked this closely earlier, it's blue. So it looks like it did go for Woodrow Wilson because of the split in the Republican vote. I can check that more accurately with other sources later. <laughs> now, Wilson, you have to imagine Wilson, yes, as a reformer, and you have to imagine him as wanting to reform uh, the way other governments work, uh, spreading democracy to the world. So, we're going to look at Mexico first. Woodrow Wilson, as president, becomes totally ticked off when he believes, whoops, the flag, the American flag, is insulted in Tampico. So he sends the United States Navy and Marines to occupy Veracruz for six months in 1914. So you can imagine how the Mexicans thought about that. Not well. This is one of the reasons America has not been popular in Mexico to this day. Now, so we also need to realize that Mexico is in revolution for much of this period. And some of our leading characters are local generals and politicians. Pancho Villa in the province of Chihuahua, Zapata down here, 
and Carranza, who is elected president and whom Woodrow Wilson supports here in the middle. So Pancho Villa wants to have more power. How is he going to do that? He's going to get the Mexican people behind him. And the way he's going to do that is by attacking Americans in Mexico. So in 1916, in January, mining men in Mexico, Americans, are shot, taken off a train and shot. This image of Villa appears in the Lancaster newspapers. And I put that there because Americans, Lancastrians at this time are very, very concerned with what's going on at the border. And the outrages of the Mexicans against civilized Americans. Now, why is this area so important? American miners have invested in it. Uh, there's copper here. And of course, the country is electrified then. And so copper wiring is extraordinarily important. So what happens? You have concern with Mexico. I should also mention, and you know that in the back of your heads, World War I is going on. It's only a European war then, it's the Great War. Now what's happening is Germany is trying to court Mexico as an ally and for its raw materials. So of course, this disruption on the Mexican border plays right into the Germans' diplomatic hands. So the next thing that happens, subsequently, our Charles P. Starr, doctor, enrolls in the Pennsylvania National Guard as an assistant surgeon. And the second thing that happens is Lancaster and many men in Lancaster form the Lancaster Military Association and they attend military lectures and they drill. And I assume Dr. Starr is one of the leaders for that. That's in March, 1916. This is part of the World War I preparedness movement that's going on across the country. Remember, Woodrow Wilson doesn't want the United States at this point to join the war. However, the United States is very involved in the war in terms of economic support for the allies and the provision of raw materials and manufactured goods to the allies. And thirdly, in terms of loans to the allies. Now, back to Mexico with this last bullet, his <coughs> company of the National Guard is nationalized in June and sent to Mexico. He is, in, he is working in the medical corps and we're going to call this the Mexican punitive expedition. At the beginning of this expedition, you're going to see the medical corps along the border, but you're going to see the troops, the active army actually invading Mexico and Northern Mexico with the approval of Carranza. That approval changes over the next several months. The second thing that happens is that the American public is strongly behind the war at the beginning. There are songs written supporting the war. People are flying flags. They're all out for this war. With the end, at the end of three or four months, the war becomes a joke. Why? They haven't found the Villaistas. It's been as though they're punching a soggy bag. Nothing happens, even though they have motorized troops, they have advanced military skills. These Villaistas who are riding horses 
in an unorganized fashion have been able to evade them. So you see on the left here how the press changes. And suddenly the man tied to the cactus is General Pershing. And he looks a little angry. And over on the left, we have a supposed Mexican warrior with a rattlesnake around his hat. And he is waving a rosette saying, Villa, dead or alive. And down here, it's called the punitive expedition. And the, <clears throat> the cartoonist comments, well named. At any rate, Carranza, the Mexican people, are furious with the Americans the further they penetrate into Mexico. And so seeing some, but not all, of the error of his ways, Woodrow Wilson withdraws those troops and Lieutenant Starr is home in Lancaster in January of 1917. Now, my next slide is a timeline. So if we look over here on the left, we have the Pennsylvania National Guard, including Starr returning. And then Starr, working with his contacts in the National Guard, gets Lancaster made the base for the Sanitation Corps of the 4th Pennsylvania National Guard, which of course Starr leads. In the meantime, on the 1st of February, Germany has, has resumed submarine warfare. And that means they're hoping, hoping, hoping that they can bring the war to an end in Europe, that England will crumble because no supplies will reach it from the United States, and that the United States will not have time to mobilize and get into the war. A month later, the Zimmerman telegram, which as you remember, I hope, <coughs> in it, Germany has promised that Mexico will regain all the territory that it gave to the United States as a result of the war in 1846 and 1847 if Mexico will wage war against the United States. The next month, Wilson asks for war. Congress responds, and it is a war to make the world safe for democracy, a war to end wars. At this point, Lieutenant Starr, you see right after the declaration, begins to form two companies for the Medical Ambulance Corps at Franklin and Marshall. And, oops, and then he re recruits, he puts news uh, ads in the newspaper. The newspapers publish these men, sign, over 100 men sign up. The college is totally excited and its alumni donate a truck to help the ambulance corps. So I have a picture of that ambulance corps fully assembled in front of what used to be the academy building, which was replaced by the Steinman College Center now on the FNM campus. So I think, but I don't know that that might be the truck. And they, these aren't guns stacked up in the middle. This is the best quality picture I could get and it's not good. Um, they're um, st stretchers. So now we've got to get these men to the war front. This is what I want you to realize. You, many of you are doctors and you think of the advances of medicine in World War I as being advances in medical care, specifically the Thomas Splint and the Carol Dakin's solution. Yes, those saved many, many legs and many, many lives. But I have this in red because this is the most important innovation, I think, is that the ambulance corps motorized and it coordinated the delivery of wounded men to medical services with automobiles 
and the French railroads. So that's what I'm going to focus on in the next part of my talk. So I have to quickly say that our ambulance division leaves for training camp. Now they've been called up in June and they don't leave for training camp in Hancock, Georgia till September. At the training camp, we'll look at their day-to-day -day activities in a moment. And down here, I had to mention that our lieutenant is going to be promoted to captain just before they get to France. So here are some pictures of the camp at Hancock, Georgia. It could hold 30,000 men. Most of those men are called up from the National Guard and they're in training. When our men get to the camp, and here are actually our men here, they learn that they are part of a motorized ambulance corps and they are ecstatic. Um, it was, had been found by the French and the early initiation of motorized ambulances in World War I, that Fords were terrific for ambulance service. They were lightweight. They didn't get bogged down as much in the muddy French fields, and they could easily be repaired uh, um, on the road by their drivers because interchangeable parts, after all. So, many of the ambulances are Fords. Now, Starr, interestingly enough, when he recruited his ambulance corps, had not anticipated this change at all. He was looking for men who knew how to shoe horses, who knew how to harness horses. And that's where he thought the ambulance service was. So this comes as a shock. Um, so I have a lineup of men here. I have our 111th. Our ambulance corps is now called the 111th. And, and These are their pup tents. This is them doing exercises. It looks like they're jumping a frog here and rope pulling down here. These pictures are all in the Lancaster Historical Society. And I put, I can't hear you. And over, over here, I put in the African-American entertainer because you know, they came from Lancaster, which was about 96% white. They're in Hancock, Georgia. And many of the racial images of the day come to play. And so the black entertainer comes into camp and entertains our boys. <coughs> I want to show you where the guys went in France. Now, Emily, I, she was wonderful, made this map. So you will see them arriving in France, going to Poisson, and then driving up here to Chateau Thierry. And uh, they are going to have their first experience with a battle in July, 1918. Most of the American soldiers did not arrive in France till the spring of 1918, and they don't go into battle on their own, under their own commands until June, really July, 1918. So this battle at Chateau Thierry is one of the first. Then you find them in <clears throat> September, Moving down here for the great Meuse Argon uh, offensive. And after the armistice, they're over here. Some of them are even in Germany as part of the occupation force for a few weeks. Then they return. So let's trace that out for a minute. All right. So, what we're going to do. I need you to put your eye on the white chart here where I'm squiggling and imagine this squiggly line at the top as the battlefront. And then you will see that the men are moved, the wounded either walk 
or are carried by stretcher to dressing stations. First aid dressing stations or FADs. Uh, and that's where our men of the 111th work. Then when, if the men who are wounded need further care and can benefit from further care, triage after all, they're moved by our motorized ambulances to field hospitals here. Then by ambulance, usually they're moved to evacuation hospitals here. Now, I have been working with a diary from an evacuation or base hospital here at Basville sur Meuse. Um, there's a woman who collected stories <coughs> from the wounded so that the Red Cross could help families locate the missing or uh, captured. I need you to pay attention in this map to the dark black lines, because what this map shows is the railroads that take the wounded behind the lines back to um, ships to take them to America. And they mainly left from San Nazar or Brest, here or here are the big American naval bases. So that's why the black lines. I presume Le Havre, which we always think of as the harbor, isn't used as much, A, because it's in the British sector, and B, because it uh, was too near the war front. <coughs> so we have them moving this way. So let's look at that. Here, first aid dressing stations could be rather rough, as you see here. So the stretcher bearers, who are not our guys, carry the men in where they are, their bandages are first applied, the tourniquets and whatnot. Then they move by ambulance, and I have one here. I was trying to find one bound uh, in the mud, but I couldn't. And they end up here at a field hospital. From there, they're going to go to our base hospital. Now, a little bit on Basual, Sir Muse. Over here on the left, I want you to ignore the 500 down here. Actually, it's the primary sources I've been reading have been saying 200. This is a tiny town where Jean d'Arc was born, and it has about 200 people. I don't know if any, everybody in 1917 had electricity or a car. Most of the transportation here is still by four-legged animal, and I've located it here on a big map of France by the red, red dot. Now, suddenly, with World War I, unbelievable. Here's Basuel sur Meuse on this map over here. And here is a map showing it becoming a base hospital. So you see, our men were in training camp from September through spring. And while they were in Camp Hancock, the American engineers and medical corps in Europe were busy building field hospitals. By the end of the war, there are about 20 of them. And unbelievable. This hospital contained Base Hop Hospital 18, which is the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and six others. Each hospital was built to hold about 1,000 patients, but it could be expanded to hold 1,500 patients. So here's a tiny town, tiny, tiny town, 200 people having this dumped on top of them in wartime. With, so you have eight hospitals, you have a thousand patients each, and then you have that all the doctors, soldiers, and nurses on top of that, about 30,000 people suddenly in this small community. <coughs> So I have another picture here, and I wanted to show you that. 
you're not very clear. I'm sorry about that, but you can get the, uh, and if you look really, really carefully, going through the middle will be the train line, which I found brought wounded in as well as took them out. So a brief digression here to the Carol Dakin method and this young man, Lieutenant John Gabriel Long, F&M 1912, Lancaster native. Graduates, goes to Hopkins. When the war breaks out and the US joins, he joins the medical service. He becomes an instructor at the War Demonstration Hospital in New York City that's at the, located at the Rockefeller Institute. And he works with Dr. Carroll there teaching surgeons who will work in the field. Here are surgeons at Buswell Base Hospital installing a Carol Dakin method on their patient who has a wounded leg here. And here is the gussied up advertisement for this care. And this, unfortunately, is Lieutenant Long's obituary from the Lancaster newspaper. In June of 1918, he had married a Lancaster RN, presumably educated at LGH. And then he had gone to New York to work on the Carol Dakin method. His wife in the great flu epidemic of the fall of 1918 contracts the disease. He comes home to Lancaster to care for her, and he contracts the disease and dies in hospital. So that's how Lancaster connects to Boswell's Sir News. I was greatly amused to find this. <coughs> now, if you'll take a moment with me to look at the summary of sick and injured at the hospital. You will see <coughs> they treated a lot of people and uh, really the war is over. They're no more wounded after November 11th, 1918. But I want you to see, uh, realize here that of the admitted, they're more admitted from disease than from injury. And this speaks to the impact of the flu, I think. So if we look at that and then look at the deaths from pneumonia, you will see that more people died from pneumonia than died from injury. Now on your next slide, I have statistics. Um, and what I did is calculate. There's also a book uh, about Boswell that came out a year before I did this research. And it, it, the argument of that doctor who wrote the book is that pneumonia and pneumonia due to influenza caused a huge percentage, almost half of all the deaths. And we must remember that the deceased included soldiers, nurses, and hospital personnel. So November 11th, war is over. And what happens is the boys finally come home in May. There's a huge parade in Philadelphia. They're mustered out on May 19th in Philadelphia. And then they all return to Lancaster on the 24th when they are greeted with applause and cheers. And here's a picture of them at the train station on their return. That's Dr. Starr on our left here, looking a bit tired from his war service and all the men of only of the troop. Only one died during the war, Harvey Hottenstein. So 
Now, you're seeing a screen with conclusion on it. I'm going to stop sharing. And what I'd like you to do is how would you conclude this talk? How is war service related to public health, related to milk inspection, related to free vaccines? Can you do that for me? I'm treating you like my classes at F and M. And my voice is going to give out. So someone's got to speak up here. I don't want to have to call on you. Turn your mic on. You guys can feel free to turn your mics on now if you want. <clears throat> that guy star? Nope. Oh. Yes. Someone spoke up. We want a conclusion or a question. I don't care. Louise, what were the real statistics at the end of the war? Before, you know, before November 11th, by November 11th, how many died from flu versus uh, injuries from the, from the war? That, <clears throat> I can try to put that back up just a minute, that screen. Um, what, now I'm trying to make the PowerPoint small, is it, and now I'm going to redo the share, hang in there. It's not cooperating. Nick, I think it says, I think the, stati <clears throat> the statistics for flu are prob probably accurate to the end. Most of the hospital closed down in January. Um, and there are a few field hospitals at as well that stay open. January of 1919? Yes. Um, you know, people think that when a war ends on November 11th, suddenly everybody's home, but there are 4 million men over there, plus nurses, doctors, support staff, God knows what, and they have taken home. That took a huge long time. I mean, some people don't get home till June. So some of the hospitals stayed open with the cases who were either too serious to move and I, that probably wasn't the pneumonia or the flu. That's what I think. But you guys who are doctors may know better. Did we know uh, whether the number of people who died from, from, from the flu, uh, what did, did the Americans and the allies experience more flu cases than uh, the enemy, Germany and its allies? We don't know. We don't know. I mean, <clears throat> the Kaiser had flu <laughs> at one point. Um, the flu was rampaging. Uh, General Pershing is given the option at one point of stopping new troops coming from the United States as a way to stop the spread because they knew that military bases were a big place of contagion. And he says, no way. So more cases keep coming from the United States and the United States between September and October, as you know, is um, very infected, especially on the East Coast and at any place that they're uh, departure points. We also know that the flu spread a lot after that event in Philadelphia. And yeah. you said that um, many of these soldiers then came to Lancaster. Do we know how many of those soldiers that came from Philadelphia to Lancaster, how many of them were contra contracted the flu? Okay, uh, Nick, chronology here. There's uh, the parade in Philadelphia, but people are coming to Lancaster from all over. And um, from what I've read about the flu, I mean, I've read 
primary sources from little towns in Arkansas that are wiped out by the flu. And if you just look at Philadelphia, that's not the only way that the flu spread. It came from everywhere. Yeah. Um, and as we learn from COVID, the better the transportation, the better, the faster diseases like this spread. So in the United States, the flu actually began in the spring of 1917. And then it goes through a period and it dies down and then it starts up again, both in the South and in Boston and at naval bases. And then the game is on. So I have another lecture that I give to another class on the flu. And I didn't review that lecture with uh, showing the maps of the spread. So I'm working from mem uh, a year old memory here, and I might be, a, be being a bit more general than necessary. That is good. Yeah, thank you for that, yeah. I have a question um, regarding the flu and the effects on the battlefield right. uh, in World War I. Uh, do, we, do we have any idea what role it played in those final battles? Uh, in which uh, the, the Germans were unsuccessful and uh, the, then their economy collapsed? Uh, I would have to show you a slide showing uh, the difference that the American troops made and the diminution of uh, manpower. Uh, the German manpower is totally outnumbered by the allies, including the Americans, by the fall of 1918. Okay. That's from desertion or the flu. I don't know. It's not just from the flu. It's from everything. And in the beginning of the war, the armies are more or less equal. And then it just <laughs> declines, declines, declines. I have a slide to show that, but... I can't do it now. I'm sorry. Okay, so it may have it may have played a role, but it wasn't uh, probably wasn't the primary role. It, it, yeah. It's it's not a turning point. No. Okay, thank you. But 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 it's there, and everybody's blaming the spread of the flu on everybody else. Mm -hmm. There's even, and this will amuse you, I hope. There's um, most of you don't realize that there are Chinese students in. Um, not students, workers in France, about 10, 15,000 of them. And they may have bought flu as well. Mm. So flu is traveling by boat then, so it's slower. But around the world, the contagion goes on for from 1917 for three or four years. So I've been sitting here knowing that and thinking, well, maybe our doctors and what we can do now will stop it before three or four years. But if it's like the past, it isn't going to happen. And I'm sorry we are where we are now. I'm bored with it. And so are you. I've Thank had you. too. Anybody? I'm not sure we're bored, but we sure are tired. <laughs> Well, we're coming up on our time here. Any other questions for Dr. Stevenson? Dr. Stevenson, what a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. You're yes. very welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, I want um, Charles Starr to get some respect. He's kind of an amazing guy. Yeah. And um, the Public Health Service one of the burgeoning majors now at college is public health. So I wanted people to see uh, a period in which public health was so important. Yeah. The other thing that's important to me is make, making us realize that history is all around us. We are in it and living it. And that's what I like to write about. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everybody else who took the time to listen to the lecture. It was fantastic. Thank you again, Dr. Stevenson. 
Um, our next lunch and learn is in March. We're not going to do one in February. Uh, it will be presented by Dr. Alan Peterson, and he will be talking about climate change and health. Uh, so keep an eye on our social medias, and if you're on our email list, you'll get a heads up as to when um, that will be. So thank you all, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And again, thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Oh, thank you for being a great audience. Thank you.